Only four weeks now, Ross, until we go racing again. Uh, how busy have you been? Uh, pretty busy. Yeah, there's a lot, uh, a lot to do. And of course, things are changing almost on a day to day basis. So um, uh, it's, um, it's been pretty hectic and working closely with the FIA, working with the teams, uh, all the logistical challenges, putting everything in place. But I think that's something which motor racing is good at. I think that's our forte, organizing things, um, logistics, movements, plan A, plan B, plan C. So um, it's, uh, it's something we're used to, obviously very different circumstances. But um, you know, when you look at the operation of a Formula 1 team and you look at the fact that uh, a Formula 1 car goes racing and is reliable and performs, etc., it's because we're very good at the detail. And um, that's what we've been busy with for several weeks and we will be up until we get to Austria. So we've got eight races. Now, have you got beyond that with the calendar, uh, Ross? And what are we expecting towards the back end of the year in the autumn? Um, <clears throat> well, we move in. We move into the flyaway uh, series then, and um, you know, because every country is at different phases of this disease, this pandemic, then some countries which are quite difficult at the moment, we're optimistic, will improve enough in time for us to go there. I think where we have permanent circuits then uh, it's easy to make a relatively late call. Where we have to build a circuit, then um, they need more notice. But of course, even with a flyaway, you've got um, the logistics are more difficult. Normally we'd sea freight a lot of stuff and um, that means long lead times. So uh, it's proven quite challenging in the second half, but I think we'll have a pretty decent season. I think there's, um, there's a lot of things starting now to come uh, to fall into place. Ross, uh, loving the low drag haircut there. Um, you must be pretty satisfied, actually. The team seem as if they've really engaged well with budget caps, with all sorts of, they've been quite pliant and helpful. Maybe when they're turning around and talking to their, their own boards and bosses, uh, this pandemic has made them all have to think a little bit differently as well. But we seem to, re other than Toto doesn't want a reverse grid, we'll talk about that later on, but um, the team's, and the FIA, Formula One, they seem to be, as best I've ever seen, pulling all in the same direction at the same time. Yeah, it's been very encouraging. I mean, you know how competitive Formula One is and uh, um, getting the teams to agree on things is, is pretty challenging because they quite naturally defend their, their competitive position. But I think uh, everyone realised, unless we made these changes, uh, it was going to be a struggle to go to the board of a multinational and not be able to offer these reductions in order to stay in the sport. And touch wood at the moment, we've not lost anyone. We're not, we don't think we're going to lose anyone, but I think if we hadn't done those changes, I think it would have been much more uh, difficult for some of the uh, organizations to carry on. And um, you know, this pandemic is going to bring a lot of changes. And I think Formula One has been sensible to uh, adopt the changes that are coming because um, I think it'd be great for the sport anyway, but I think it gives people uh, the sustainability to carry on and um, continue in the sport. Ross, are you happy with the extent of the changes, you know, in terms of, for example, the aero rules, you know, you've got increments of, of two and a half percent for every position. Would you have liked to have seen more to try and, you know, just really bring that midfield battle up towards the top three? Um, I'm pretty happy. I mean, you know, we, we've got an accumulation of changes. In a way, we don't want to uh, do things we have to reverse out of or we find have uh, more extreme impact. I mean, we've got the budget cap. We've got the <clears throat> uh, a number of standard parts are coming into Formula 1. Uh, open source design parts. So, uh, if you design a part, you have to give that design um, into a library that other people can access to see if they want to use a part the same as you've made. Uh, so there's a lot of equality things going on, but we need to keep the competition and we're keeping the competition in the areas that we think um, are of most interest to the fans. So the aerodynamics, um, there's still some uh, differentiation on the engine side, the suspension, 
Uh, so we've got those areas which the fans can engage with, they can understand, but the areas which don't matter, but where improvements for those that had the funds, um, we've neutralized those areas. So I'm pretty happy and this, um, you know, this adjustment in the aerodynamic uh, capacity of the teams, depending on where they finish in the championship, uh, is I think a gentle step in the right direction. You still have to do a great job to win a Formula One race. You won't win a Formula One race because you've got the least handicaps of everyone. It's formulae that rely on weight penalties, and, and that's good in their formulae, but that's not Formula One. Uh, so we always want to have a meritocracy in Formula One, and I think a great team that finishes first in the World Championship may have a little less aerodynamic capacity than a team at the back of the grid. Um, but if our team at the back of the grid don't use that extra resource sensibly, it will be wasted. Ross, a few years ago, I remember reading your book and actually this morning a quote in there came back to me and I just I just want to run it by you and see if you regret it because in here you say when, I, when you were leaving Mercedes at the end of 2013, you knew you were going to be very competitive and I said to Toto Wolf, you have several challenges. One of the biggest that you will have is politically maintaining your dominance. I told him he had to start thinking about how to deal with that. He was going to have shells exploding over his head. And, and you speak really well about how your challenge at Ferrari was, you know, un making sure that you were on the right side of the rules and things. Uh, do you slightly regret giving him that advice now? And, and you know, now you've turned Porsche to a gatekeeper. What do you reckon? Um, I don't think Toto needed my advice. He knew that was going to come. And uh, he's been very good at uh, defending his position. So he's a very bright guy. And uh, he's um, he's been, de been defending Mercedes' position very well. I think in, in reply to some of Toto's comments, some of them are valid. Uh, I'm not sure where the F1 survey came from. I've not seen that one. Um, but where we, why we... Uh, resurrected this idea was because of the consecutive track which we're going to have for at least two races this year maybe more and therefore it seemed an ideal opportunity at the second race to um, try a different format and I think those issues that Toto was concerned about and mostly most of them could be addressed with the teams working well together but of course at the moment, it needs unanimous decision. And once you've got one or two teams that don't want to uh, support the time, so we've dropped the idea for now. Dropped the idea, but um, Ross, it, it's quite interesting hearing what you're saying and getting these rules across. You're saying about how it's sort of just gentle encouragement, if you like. But the first time we've really had an aero handicap system, um, going back to that, I mean, do you think it could mean uh, great change. Could it could it usher in an, an era for the independence again? Do we think we might be moving more towards that, as you were saying, than, than, the, than the, th the dominance of the top three teams? I think of our survival. I mean, with the say, this is a, a problem we've been tackling on many fronts, and one of them is the prize money. You know, the prize money was very heavily biased towards the top teams, and as of next year. The, the midfield teams will be getting a much bigger slice of the pie and that will make a good midfield team sustainable, financially sustainable, uh, with a modest amount of sponsorship, cap, more prize money. Suddenly you've got a, a much more viable case for um, a good midfield team to be uh, economically viable and, and be sustainable. So that's it's come at many fronts, but I think we are going to be entering a much better period for the smaller and midfield teams. Uh, yeah, Toto's job is to protect Mercedes competitive. Uh, Ed, your your job at Formula One is to make uh, Formula One better and uh, a better business. Our job on Sky F1 is to amplify and spread the gospel. I, I'm up for the, the uh, qualifying race in reverse grid. Uh, I really am. It'll give oxygen to the small teams at the front of the grid, the meritocracy is you've earned your place at the back of the grid, you're leading the world championship. And I think the drivers will look absolute heroes coming through. It'd be fascinating to watch, as you say, 
at those second races. So I, I, I'm, I'm right up for it. But uh, talking of the minnows at the moment, sadly, that includes Williams these days. And we're hearing they're up for sale, Ross. I saw a comment of yours saying you thought there were some credible buyers around. It's obviously incredibly worrying for Formula One that a team like Williams has had to put itself up for sale. It is very disappointing, but I think you probably, if you look at it and you look at the performance of Williams by their own admission, it's been very poor for the last few years. And I think when you continue at that level, um, you're going to suffer. And it would almost be wrong if you didn't suffer, if you perform that badly. So I think it's a consequence of the very poor performance for the last few years. And, um, you know, even a team with the heritage and name of Williams, if you don't perform, you, you're going to have problems. And um, uh, I really hope and I believe that there'll be um, a way forward for Williams. And um, particularly with all the things we've done, we've made, as I say, we've made that model far more sustainable. And um, uh, I'm optimistic that we can uh, find ways of keeping Williams in the sport. Ross, I just want to, to bring you on to one of the uh, huge issues um, in the world and in the sport right now. And the comments of Lewis Hamilton uh, over uh, Twitter and a series of social media po posts, quite rightly, he's used his platform for good. He went on to say, I'm one of the <laughs> only people of colour in F1, yet I stand alone. I would have thought by now you would see why this happens and say something about it but you can't stand alongside us. Uh, subsequently, other drivers and people within the paddock, whether it be media or um, uh, team managers or bosses, et cetera, have tweeted their support. Um, what would you say to, to those comments um, uh, from Lewis? Um, and yeah, what, what is F1's stance on this? Well, I think Lewis is a great ambassador for the sport. And I think his comments uh, are very valid and we support him completely. I think we as F1, have recognized for a few years now that we want to strengthen our diversity and um, uh, our diversity program. And both internally as a company and externally, we started work on this a few years ago. Um, I think what we concluded or our thoughts were that the reason why we don't have more diversity in Formula One, it starts at the very beginning. It starts at grassroots level and it even starts in the schools with the appeal for uh, stem topics science technology engineering maths um, and how can we get involved in that so we've uh, been involved in formal one in schools now for um, we all supported it but we've become far more involved in the last year or two and that has a very strong uh, diversity in terms of the kids that get involved in that 40% of the people that uh, the kids that get involved in formal schools um, are girls. So that's a good start. And it's an international competition. So we get uh, we get competitors from all groups. We're looking very strongly at how we can support grassroots racing level. Uh, I've spent the last uh, weeks and months working with a group to look at how we can have a really, really basic uh, karting initiative to get um, kids involved in karting at a very early stage. The fact is Formula One is a very strong meritocracy. It should always be that way. It should always be the best um, who win. And we can't force that, but we can give greater opportunity to um, minority and ethnic groups to get involved in motorsport not just driving but engineering and other activities and um, that's where we are with formula one we support totally what lewis has said and uh, you know, what happened was dreadful uh, it happens far too often and i think you've seen the public reaction to it that um, it's almost the, the straw that broke the camel's back and um, we support him totally yeah, everybody hopes that it provokes the right kind of, of change. Um, do, you, do you think that, Ross, you can help economically too? Can F1 do more on that side of things? If the issue um, you know, about creating diversity is getting uh, more BAME uh, people into motorsport, can, can you provide any sort of economic um, safety net or help for them, if you like? Well, that's what we want to do with karting. 
that's what we do do with Formula One in schools. Um, as you know, we were due to have uh, some W Series races this year. Unfortunately, the pandemic has uh, delayed that. So we are uh, helping uh, with these initiatives. Only as a company, we've, we've got uh, a lot of initiatives in terms of gender pay gap and um, uh, looking at other pay gaps within our company to make sure we're doing everything we can. So I think Formula One is helping, and I think you'll see uh, with some of these karting initiatives we've been working on that that will be um, that will be a great opportunity, and Formula One will support it.